you may know this verse, you may not, but I'm going to bring it back into light. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster, to give you a, hope, a future and a hope. And I want to talk about God's plans versus our plans. <laughs> and one of the best ways I know how to do that is to talk about my eighth grade happenings, right? I, we're going to go back to eighth grade, so a little shorter. And I thought I was all that, though, right? So I'm in eighth grade, and we do this thing called a lock-in, where you're transitioning from eighth to ninth grade. And what, what happens is there's a dance, there's a, a, a bunch of basketball, gym, all that good stuff. You get locked in for 24 hours, and you get to just have a great time with your friends. So it starts off with this dance. And all my friends, I'm, I'm dating a girl at the time. Actually, my wife's in the room. I've never seen another girl in my life. I don't know what they look like. <laughs> That's right, right? Got to make sure I get it, get some bonus points there. But I'm talking to this girl, and these guys are, like, getting me pumped, right? They're getting me pumped. They're, like, hitting my shoulder, like, do it. Let's do it. Let's get it. Let's do it. Let's get it. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. Let's get it. So I go over to her. I'm like, hey, would you dance with me? And she's my girlfriend. We sit beside each other in math, so I figured that was enough, right? So I say, uh, hey, would you dance with me? Not even two seconds of thought. She said, no. And I was like, what? Why? And all of my friends were in the background, like, ready for me to, like, walk off with her. And I walked back like, mm, man. But it was just like, I, I know that's a smaller example, but oftentimes if we think about our plans, we often run into pain. Right? And that's such a small example of an eighth grade lock-in story, but a lot of us have ran into financial pain. We had a plan for our finances, and then something happened like a pandemic, and all of a sudden we're in pain. We had plans for a relationship that didn't work out. We had plans that we would see ourselves here in our five-year goals, and it just didn't work out. Sometimes... Our plans lead to pain. But what I want to tell you this morning is that if we were to focus on God's plans, I believe it would often lead to purpose. And, and don't hear me wrong. That doesn't mean it's void of pain, but it just means that our God's a redeeming God and he uses pain. Right? Where I walked into pain, God walked me into purpose. And it was all about following God's plan. And, and I think this is what we often do when we read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans, God. I know them that you have for me. So I'm going to walk this way, and I'm going to invite you into it. But that's not what the Bible says. It says, who knows the plans? It says, the Lord says that I know the plans I have for you. So more so than inviting God into my plan, I want to ask God, hey God, what is your plan for my life? What is the purpose that you have for me? Because at the end of the day, I don't know the plan. And I'm okay with that because I trust the one who holds it. And I'm hoping that somebody will get excited this morning as we talk about our purpose, because I believe God's going to spark purpose back in your life. He's going to give you that sense of, I actually belong to this place. I actually am here for a reason, and we're going to talk about that today. But I want you to write this down. If you're taking notes, here's the title for today's message, Get Your Purpose Back. Come on, would you get your purpose back? You were made on purpose for a purpose. We want you here at Lift to get your purpose back, but I can't go any farther without praying, so would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, you don't make your plans unattainable. God, you make them available and open, so we take a holy pause and say, Lord, speak. God, would you speak? Would you be in this place? Would you release your purpose, your peace, whatever somebody needs this morning? Would you be able to be their provider, Lord? And we, we believe that plans and purposes will be delivered all over this room in your mighty name. We all agree by saying amen, amen. Hey, this morning we're going to be hanging out with some old people. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your neighbor. Actually, now that you've looked at your neighbor, look at your neighbor again and say, you look young. You look young and you look good. We're here to encourage people in church this morning. But the people I'm talking about are Abraham and Sarah, right? We find them in the Old Testament and they are having this issue. Actually, where we're picking up is Abram. He's not even called Abraham yet, but Abram is in this place where God needs to remind him over and over again. This is the second of three times he reminds Abram of the promises he has for him. And a lot of us in the room, I think we need reminders, right? If you haven't seen it, you should go back to Pastor Drew's message last week. He talks about how to get your strength. One thing is to remember, our God is reminding us, just like Abram. And this is where we pick up on the reminder that God gives us. Hey, I still have called you. 
I still have a purpose for you. I still have a future for you. I still have hope. And we pick up in this story in Genesis 15, 2 through 7. It says this, but Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? The promise is that he would have sons and daughters that outnumbered the stars in the sky. And he hasn't even had a son yet. It says, since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord started to talk. The Lord said, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son. Of your own, who will be your heir? Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And I love verse 6 because it's, I believe this is all God's asking of us this morning. He says, and Abram believed the Lord. Would you believe today? Would you believe you still got purpose? Would you believe after the marriage fell through, you still have a purpose and God's still got a plan? Would you believe if the finances or if the kids have gone away and they're not in church? Would you believe this morning? Because this is what happened when Abram believed. It said, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Not because of what he did, but because he believed. we got to believe the Lord and what he says. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. He's doing it again. He's reminding him. Would you remember who I am? I'm the God who is faithful to my promises. I will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. I brought you out, and I will still be your provider. And I think verse 6, where Abram believed, was, was an aha moment, if we call it that. right? Like, I finally figured it out. It's like when you finally put that thing together, and you're like, aha, I got it. Showed you. Told you. Right? It's, it's that moment where he's like, I, I finally get it. God, God actually means what he says. And God is actually going to provide. And, and thankfully, I get a couple bonus points because aha actually sets me up for the three points I'm going to help you all get your purpose back with. Right? Because aha stands for three things that we're going to talk about this morning. But you have to know that there is an aha moment for your marriage. There is an aha moment for your family. There is an aha moment when you're looking for someone that will make the rest of your life. Uh, there is an aha moment when things don't go your way that God actually does have a plan. And the aha is this, there's three things. A, awakening. Would you wake up to the fact that you have purpose? That God has made you for a reason? And after awakening, would you, would you decide to H, be honest? Would you be honest with whether you're pursuing that or not, or whether you're coming towards that goal or maybe away from it? And that's okay if you're here today. We just are asking honesty. And number three is action. Would you take action to follow God and the plans he has for your life? So we're going to break this down. Number one, awakening. Right, what is an awakening? And a lot of Marvel fans, Disney Plus fans, anybody who really watches movies, we can see this happen all the time. There's this idea that something is on the inside. Something has been there for forever, but it's just taken a while to come out. It's just had to wake up, right? Spider-Man finally gets to wake up to his purposes after the spider bite. Captain, uh, Captain America has this goodness built in the inside of him, but has no way to do it. But then all of a sudden, he gets a serum, and he becomes like the dude. Right? And, and what I want to encourage you with that is there's an awakening that we can have. Right? There's actually an awakening to the Spirit of God that says, hey, there's actually a purpose and a plan for your life. Hey, there's actually something that I put on the inside of you that is ready to come out whenever you decide to follow my plan. Right, And I, I think that's true for the single mother and the single father in the room. I think that's true for the person that doesn't think it's true. I think it's true for the person who's currently in an addiction to alcohol, drugs, or pornography. He's still got a plan, even if you walked in with that addiction. Would you trust his plan? He has a plan for your life, and I can't say that I know that for a fact. It's not, you're not basing it on my credibility. We're basing it on the Bible. Because when we look at Psalms 139, 13, and 14, and verse 16, it says this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop. What that means is not when it says fearfully and wonderfully made, it doesn't mean, oh, God, I messed up on this one. I meant to give her a freckle, and I gave her a mole. What am I doing? I messed up. I can't believe it. I meant to give her a you know, that's not what it looks like 
when that verse is talking about fearfully and wonderfully made. Pastor Drew made it clear to me, and I love when he made this very clear for me. He said, fearfully is the idea of this. Imagine sitting on a 4th of July night, and the first firework shoots up into the sky. Boom. And everybody, wow. Wow, that's amazing. That, that is awe-inspiring. When you are beautifully and wonderfully made, right, when he says this in his scripture, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, fearful really means he had a sense of awe while doing it. Wow, I love how I made him. I love how I made her. There's a sense of awe found in this scripture. And then it goes on to say, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And in transparency, that was the hardest part, the hardest part of that scripture. I didn't know it full well. I would still compare. I would still think somebody was better than me. I would still think I'm not funny enough. I would still think my life isn't as good as their life. Because I didn't know full well that God made me with a purpose. And I think if we were to really understand he has that, you wouldn't have to look to your left or your right. You could look straight forward at the race he set for you and say, it doesn't matter what they're doing. I know I got a purpose and I'm going to walk in that. But we got to know it full well. And I'm speaking to myself here too because I want to know it full well. And here, here's three really practical steps if you don't. Here's three ways that I was able to really understand full well what God has put me here for. And the first one is this. Ask yourself this question. What do you hate? What do you hate in this world? And I know a lot of us would say slow internet, traffic, when someone doesn't take out the trash and it just continues to see how high we can pile it. <laughs> it's not, I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about you hate abuse, so you become a social worker. I'm talking about you hate divorce, so you become a counselor and you see marriages restored. I'm talking about you become somebody who's, who's just... They hate the fact that people aren't being utilized and can't provide for their family, so you become a business owner because you want to see the most in people and that they can provide for their families. I don't know what it is for you, but what do you hate? Maybe it's a lack of organization and you want to become administration. I don't know, but ask yourself that question. The next one is this. What do you love? What do you love? I, I know for Jesus it was pretty clear. He loved his sheep. He loved the sick. He loved the hurting. And we also know that he hated that no one, that they didn't have anyone to help them. Right, that's why he came. Jesus demonstrated all three of these. So what do you hate? What do you love? Which I got to take a second and say, I love the next generation. I love being a part of the church that is tomorrow and building them today. Like that's why I'm in youth ministry because I believe that the church is healthy and it's growing. And I know you all partner with us and how we're praying for them. But the students right here are the church of tomorrow and they're going to be raising stuff up. So I love seeing the next generation come up. I love seeing the church of tomorrow being built today. And that's why I'm in youth ministry. And that's why I stay in it because I'm called to that place. Right? So maybe you don't know what you hate, what you love. My next question would be this. What pain have you had? Because some of y'all have had serious pain in your life. Some of y'all have dealt with financial burdens and not had money. Some of y'all had dealt with infertility. Some of you have dealt with um, just, just not having the relationships you've wanted to. And some have fell through while others have stayed and you never thought they'd fall through. But, but I know in a lot of stories, a lot of people we hear about, if you read their biographies, all of them have some sort of pain that launched them into their purpose. Right, like Dave Ramsey, if you don't know him, you should if you need financial help because he's a guru. But he started out broke. He was broke, and his pain led him into his purpose. Let's not just talk about him. Let's get to the Bible. Abraham and Sarah, they were barren. They didn't have any kids. But their purpose was that they would be the father and mother of many nations. Right, it's often your pain that will lead you into a purpose. So you got to know that pain isn't always a bad thing. Maybe it's pointing you in the direction you should be headed. And that you can use that to heal somebody. Maybe your pain was addiction, and now you're going to help free others. Right? This is something that we have to ask ourselves, and this is what I believe, that, that when we get into that place, when we kind of identify from those three questions what our purpose is, we have to understand this. A lot of times when God gives you a purpose, he, he gives boundaries as well. And someone was like, yeah, that's why I don't follow him, because he locks me in. He keeps me in the box. No, 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 no. Here, here's what I want you to realize, that there's often blessings and boundaries. That a boundary is often a blessing. Can I, can I explain this to you better? H how many of you have seen the slingshot in Ocean City? You know that ball of death that just, and every time you think it's going to break because the things are going like that, 
Yeah, I'm talking about that thing. So let's think about that. Or even a roller coaster. How many people like roller coasters in the room? Yeah, we got some people. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I love roller coasters. But here's what you wouldn't love. If the technician came on and was like, sorry, our lap bars aren't working today. We hope you enjoy the ride. None of y'all are getting on that ride. If the guy told you the slingshot, he said, yeah, one of the cords is kind of like it broke yesterday. It's really old. We just taped it back together. You should be all right. None of y'all would go on because you'd be afraid that thing would just launch one way, right? You know what I'm saying? But here's what I know. Those, those boundaries are actually blessings for our life. We get to enjoy things like the slingshot or the roller coaster or whatever it may be because of boundaries. They actually bless us. And this isn't just something that I can show you with a couple rides. This is something we see in the scripture. We think about Adam and Eve. The blessing was found in the boundary that they would not eat from the tree of good and evil. The blessing was actually the boundary for Abraham to say, hey, you can't stay where you are. You can't stay stagnant. You have to go to the land I'm leading you to so you can be the father of many nations. Maybe not Abraham. Maybe it's Rebecca who had to leave her home and go to Isaac and say, hey, I can't stay in this place because actually I believe that the boundary Lord has set for me is that I don't stay here and I'm blessed as I go. Right? And, and, and we think about Moses going back to Egypt and ultimately Jesus. The blessing that he had in a boundary to say, I will live in the boundaries of a human life. I will walk the walk that they do, and I will not sin, and I will be a blessing to everyone. Because I stayed in the boundaries. Not my will, Father, but yours. His plans. We've got to look at Jeremiah 29, 11 and realize he has plans for your life. For it's his plans, right? And when you realize that, number two, you've got to be honest. You've got to start having honesty. Am I pursuing it? Am I not? Am I pursuing um, the company dream that he gave me? Am I reading my word? Am I, am I believing not just for a spouse, but that I would be the spouse that is one that's humble? Right? We often pray, I want them to look like this and act like this and be like that. But what if you started praying, God, make me more humble. Make me more transparent. Make me into the man that someone would love. Make me into the woman that some man would love. Right? We've got to be honest with ourselves. Are we going towards that thing? Are we asking God to continue to reveal his plan for us. And the average Christian would say no. Why? 13 minutes. 13 minutes is the average time a Christian opens their Bible per month. 13 minutes a month, the average Christian reads their word. 23 minutes. 23 minutes is the average time a Christian prays per month. And that's including the blessing over the greasy cookout tray. I know from experience, i got to really bless that thing. It's too greasy. Anyways, 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 let's get back to it. But let's be real. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe you're not struggling with your praying and your reading. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's this. Honestly, last year I focused on my problems a lot more than his promises. Right? Because he, he says that I could cast all my anxiety and cares on him, but I would cast it to him and I'd almost monitor it in his hands. God, you still got it? You sure? I could take it back. I'll, I'll take the anger. No, he says when you cast it, you can give it and walk away and say, hey, it's not saying that I won't ever have anxiety. It's just saying I know where to place it. It's not saying I never will have depression. It just says I know where to place my depression. It's not saying I'll never experience pain. I just know where to go with my pain. Right? And that's where we have to get honest. That's where we have to get real. I wrote this. Honesty is this. I fell into Facebook last year more than I put my face in his book. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's corny, I know, but you won't forget it. <laughs> it's corny, but it's real. Social media, we can go so deep into social media, but maybe honesty is this. I'm losing my purpose, and I just need somebody to pray. I'm lost, and I need some help. And I, I just want to say, for, we're, we have that available for you. This is our last week of 21 days of prayer. right? And, and I want to encourage you, break the statistic. Be the person who says, you know what, I'm going to show up one time Monday through Friday this week, and I'll break the statistic that we open our book for more than 13 minutes or we pray more than 23. Because you're there for one hour, you would break that statistic. All the competitive people in the house are like, amen, let's do this thing. Right? But we, we're serious because one moment with God could change the next, that, next years for you. Right? One hour could change one year. You don't know what it looks like, but I do know that God moves in a moment. So would you come out to 21 days of prayer? Would you expect him to move? Would you expect the breakthrough to come through? And maybe you're like, Jay, I need more than that. 
I, I'm a little broken. I need more than a week. We'll come back in two weeks and hear about our freedom groups. Man, those freedom groups are amazing, and you're going to hear a testimony from somebody here at Lyft. And I, I don't do it justice because, really, you get to see what the Lord has done and what he will continue to do. Because here's what I know. The Lord cannot heal what you hide. So honesty is a great thing. You don't even have to be honest like, Lord, I love you. You could be mad. You could say, Lord, I don't trust you. I don't know what's going on. At least you're honest. Because the man will heal when you open up, but he can't heal what you hide. How do I know this? We look at Sarah. We look at Sarah and Abraham. Sarah in the scriptures says she laughed at God. <laughs> you think you can give me a kid? Do you see this? I'm like 100 years old. How are you going to do this? This is old. I'm not doing this. And God said, hey, you know what? Thank you. Now watch me. <laughs> at least you were honest. At least you told me where you were at. At least you didn't try to hide it anymore because God doesn't want you to hide it. He wants you to be honest so he can bring healing. He wants you to bring healing. And this is what Sarah did. She started to continue to move towards God even in her doubt. And what I want to say is I wish somebody would, would, would just put their hands together in faith because here's what I know, that God doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't already done. So God was honest with himself and said, hey, I can't stay in heaven any longer. i got to go down to earth, so I'm sending my son Jesus because I can't deal with the pain that my people are facing. I didn't just stay on earth and show you miracles, but I actually went to the cross to die a death that you deserved so that you could have real life. And I didn't just stay on the cross. I actually went to the grave, but I came back up again, and I had life and life to the full. And I didn't leave you alone when I went back to heaven. I promised an advocate, and his name's the Holy Spirit, and he was a helper, and he was a comforter, and he was an empowerer. So everything you aren't, I am. Everything you don't have, I have. The peace you're lacking, I got it. The mercy you need, I'm bringing it. The truth I have, I give to you. This is our God, and this is who he is. He doesn't ask you to do something he hasn't already done. You just got to be honest with him. You just got to be real with him and say, this is where I'm at, Lord. And he says, in your weakness, he provides strength. Wherever you're weak at this morning. I don't care if it's mental, emotional, in your marriage, relationships, whatever it may be, God is your provider. He is empowered, and he can do whatever you need him to do. So listen, when we're pursuing a God like that, when we're honest with ourselves, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require from us action. Right? And as I conclude today, we're going to be talking about action. Here's two ways that you can take action. Talk back and be obedient. And some moms in the house, my mom online, is probably like, Jay, don't give them the blessing to talk back. My daughter and my son do that just fine. I don't need any help from you telling them to talk back. And I'm not telling y'all to talk back to your parents or your coworker or your boss. I'm telling you to talk back to yourself. I'm telling you to talk back to Satan when he tries to tell you you're not enough. And y'all think this is something new that I came up with or, or some creative way. No, this has been in the Christian faith for thousands of years. What do I mean by that? Check out this picture. Go ahead and throw that on here. This is, this is a vagrius of Pontius. This man lived from 345 A.D. to 399 A.D. This book title alone gets me fired up. If I ever write a book like this and have a title like that, I'm retiring. Like, that's enough for me. <laughs> Why? Because check this out. His title is Talking Back, a Monastic Handbook for Combating Demons. Translated, a monk's going to go to battle. This is a guidebook for a monk to beat up some demons, like to demolish demons. This is not something new that I found. He was actually what they called a desert father because they read in scripture what happened when Jesus went into the desert. The devil tried him, but then what happened? Jesus talked back. He decided, no, you can't tell me that. I'm the head of not to tell. You can't tell me that you have all the power to give to me. I, my father has the power, and you're not testing him. And what did the devil do? He had to flee. And that's what this man was saying, that we need to start talking back. We need to talk back to those thoughts. We need to come into 21 day or saying, I'm talking about, I will find peace in a pandemic. I will be unified in the body, even though what the enemy came is to divide. No, not in this house, because my enemy, God says to pray for him. So go ahead and show me my enemy's devil. Guess what? You just gave me another way to pray. Guess what? You just gave me another way to reach out, because oftentimes when I pray for my enemy, I start to get perspective of what happened to them. Wow, maybe because the, I... They hurt me. Maybe it's because they were hurt. 
wow, they did me wrong. Maybe it's because they have a different background than I did and they didn't really understand. Right? And that's what I'm trying to say, that we have to start talking back. We need to start talking back and saying, hey, I, I don't, I, when you tell me I need to cut because I'm not enough, God says I'm more than enough. When I compare myself and I think I need to lose weight or I need to go into this eating disorder, no, actually the Bible says that I'm more than enough. I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. God has plans for me. I'm starting to talk back. I'm starting to tell the devil where he needs to go. And maybe for some of y'all, this is all it looks like. Maybe you're at home and you're as broke as a joke. And you sit there and you say, but God, you are my provider. I'm not looking at my problems. I'm focusing on your promises. Because I trust you and I know you will come to pass when I need you. Just call on his name. For some of you, this week it'll just look like this. Shut up, devil. Would you just shut up? Shut up, devil, and Jesus, speak up, because I need to hear your voice above anything else in my life. This next one is this, be obedient. Be obedient. Genesis 26, 5 shows this verse, right? This is, this is God, I should give it a little preface, this is God talking to Isaac about blessing him, saying, hey, I want to bless you, I want to provide for you, I want the same promise that was over your father to be the same promise that is over you, and we pick up, and it says this, God's talking to Isaac, and he says, I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. This is what I want to tell for you. This isn't for you, just you. The purpose God has for your life is not just for you. It's for the people next to you. It's for the people next to you's kids. It's for your kids' kids. The plans and purposes God has for you is way bigger than just you. Abraham's obedience actually led to Isaac's blessing. So what if you are obedient and you said, I'm going to step into freedom group and I'm going to believe that God's going to heal me of this addiction so my son doesn't have to deal with it. That I'm actually going to get healed. I'm going to go into a small group and I'm going to believe that there's going to be truth and healing found in this small group. And now my son, when he, I see the comparison I used to deal with, I'll pl completely erased from him. When my daughter doesn't have to deal with the eating disorder that I had to deal with because I decided to be obedient, to trust God. So this is what I kind of wrote it. In conclusion, just the simplified terms for me is simply this. God's providence is found in my obedience. God's providence is found in my obedience. And this is what I mean by that. I can remember, no idea why God, Pastor Drew, used me, thought of me. I, I don't know. But here's where I am. And I had just got done asking God. I was at his youth ministry. And like I told you all, we talked about middle school at the top of this message. Let's bring it back home with another middle school story. So I'm a lot older, and I'm a junior in high school, but Pastor Drew asked me to speak at a camp, a middle school camp. And I had just got done praying that God would give me a blank check, like I would give him a blank check. Whatever you want to do, God, your plans and your purposes. But in reality, on the side, I was like, but I know it's exercise science, and I'm going to become a physical therapist. So thank you anyways. Amen. Right, like the prayer, but my stipulation at the end of it. I'm like, yeah, thank you, da, 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 but you're still going to do what I want. Amen. No, but I walk into this place, and I felt like I did terrible. <laughs> I'm preaching to 20 middle schoolers. My eyes twitching. My face is red. I feel like I'm drooling. I just, I, it's, it just feels like I'm so full of shame. How could I ever speak in front of anyone? So I walk off so discouraged, and I'm like, man, I forgot my Bible. And I walk back up, and I go into this room. And Pastor Drew, the director of the camp, and another leader at the time, not in a weird way, but just, just in an honest way, or just on the ground. And I'm just here, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my message was so bad, I put him to sleep. <laughs> it's so bad. And I walk in, and I'm like, hey, is everything okay? And they get up slowly, not in a weird way, or anything that seemed weird, but they looked at me, and they said, I just hope you realize you were called. And I hope that you're obedient to the purpose that God is calling you to, and we believe that's ministry, and that we were just praying they're healed. I was like, what? You know what I'm saying? But I, I just sat there, and I can remember. I went to play collegiate soccer, and God said, hey, that's not the plan I have for you. You're called to ministry. So I left my freshman year, and I came back, and I joined youth ministry. And I joined in youth ministry, and Pastor Drew just kept asking me to help more and more and more. And then all of a sudden, Pastor Drew said, hey, would you just show up and, and be there for the soundboard? And I was like, the soundboard? I don't know anything about sound, reverb, all that. I don't, it doesn't make sense, but I decided to be obedient. And I'm obedient. And then God says, hey, or Pastor Drew says, hey, uh, you want to speak a couple more messages? I don't know why you are asking me, Pastor Drew. You saw what I did at middle school camp. But yeah, I'll do it. 
And then I keep stepping, and then a few years later, all of a sudden, Pastor Drew comes up, and he's like, hey, man, uh, God put a church on my heart, and I want to call it Lift. Do you think you'd be a pastor of the next generation with me? Do you think you'd love on people like Jesus would? Do you think you'd help me expand Salisbury for the kingdom of God, and we'd see salvations all over Salisbury? That we'd see baptisms, we'd see lives changed? And I said, absolutely. Absolutely. And can I tell you, this isn't what I did do. I wasn't funny enough. I wasn't favor like I, I wasn't the right style. I didn't have all the right words, but I just decided to be obedient. <laughs> I just decided to talk back when the devil said I wasn't enough. I said, actually, I'm more than enough according to God, so I don't really understand it yet, but I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to believe that God put me in a place for a purpose, and he has a plans for me. I'm so trust what he says, not what you say, and I'm going to keep moving. And can I tell you, I still don't know what my purpose is at the end of the day, but here's what I do know. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to show up. I'm going to believe God for what he says, and when I get discouraged, I'm going to go back to his promises. And this is all that I'd ask for you today. If you don't know what your purpose is in the room, if you've been lacking from purpose, you don't even have to know what it is, but you've got to be obedient. you just got to take a step. you got to say, God, I don't know what's happening, but I believe you're restoring my family. I don't think you could restore a marriage like mine, but you're restoring it. You say you are. You're my provider, and you just slowly walk into a purpose by talking back to the devil, talking back to yourself, and taking action. Come on, would you decide to be obedient? And here's what I love, and this is kind of how I'll just end it. Abraham's obedience led to Isaac's blessing. Can I tell you, that was just a foreshadow. That was just a hint of what was to come. Because in reality, when we look at that, we see someone who was so much greater that would arrive in Scripture, that would uh, arrive on earth, and his name was Jesus. And Jesus walked a walk that we had to walk. He came under every kind of sin and temptation we could ever come under, and he beat it. And he walked in obedience up to the point of a cross and said, God, not my will, but yours be done. And his obedience led to the blessing that every single one of us in this room can receive today, and it's the gift of salvation. It's the gift that we don't have to earn. It's the gift that I don't have to be enough. I don't have to show up. I don't have to have everything together. But what I do have to have is belief, belief that he is enough, because just like Abraham was obedient to bless Isaac, Jesus was obedient to bless everyone in the room. So I'm just going to pray two prayers over you as I leave this morning. And the first one is that purpose would be oozing out from this place. That this church would be a church of purpose in 2022. And the second one, if you're bold enough to simply say, listen, I want the blessing that Jesus' obedience gave me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to end today believing God for more. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the purpose you have put in our hearts. And we know that you know the plan. So we turn our hearts towards heaven. We turn our hearts towards you and say, God, whatever it is, whatever the business is, whatever the family structure looks like, God, we trust you have purpose. And all we have to do is be obedient. Help us to take the one step forward. If it's in small group, whatever it looks like, let us take one step forward into your plans because your plans are for life and for hope. And I know every one of us in this room could use both of those things. So we trust you. We put everything we have in your name, God, because we can't do it in our own strength, but your spirit can, and your spirit's here in this room, and it's empowering everyone where we're weak to be strong. The temptations we can't beat, would you beat them for us? Would you be the one who breaks down the strongholds, Lord? Would you give us the hope in the future? We just show up. We just open our word. We just pray. We just trust you. And in the mighty name of God, I pray that prayer. And everyone said amen, but with every high, uh, head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to say this, that if that's you, if you want to start a new relationship with God, if you want to receive him into your life, could you just raise your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed? I just want to know who I'm praying for. I see your hand. Thank you. I saw your hand. Yeah, you can slip it back down. Thank you so much. Oh, praise God. Praise God. And listen, we don't make anyone pray by themselves, so we're going to all pray this out loud because we're, we're a church family. So if you guys would just repeat after me, Jesus, I thank you for your obedience to die a death I deserved and to live a life I never earned. God, I trust you and your plans. I believe you raised your son Jesus from the dead and that I can have eternal life through you. I receive this gift. Help me to walk out in purpose. Not just any purpose, but the purpose you have for me. I love you, Lord. I thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. And we all agreed by saying amen.